Welcome everybody. I'm Ruth Cadbury, MP. I'm one of the co-chairs of the all-party parliamentary group on walking and cycling. Uh, I'm very pleased that my fellow co-chair, Selene Saxby, is already is also here, and um, uh, that uh, uh, Lord Tony Barclay will also be uh, winding up at the end of today. Um, so for those who don't know, all party parliamentary groups, uh, there are hundreds in Parliament. Uh, we work as parliamentarians on issues that we are concerned about and interested in, uh, using our roles as parliamentarians uh, to look at and uh, um, scrutinise legislation, um, discuss uh, issues, raise issues with both formally and informally with government and so on. Um, today, we're going to be discussing uh, the all-important environment bill, a major piece of legislation for the government. Um, I just want to make it clear that we're discussing this today. Um, APPGs do not generally take strong views, particularly where it's uh, a government bill um, as, as a group, because we are uh, we, we include members of all parties, including, of course, the government party. But this is a really important opportunity to discuss the environment bill particularly um, in respect of, of, of um, outdoor access uh, and, and, our, you know, and, and our amazing uh, 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 rural wilderness uh, and green space environments uh, and how active travel uh, is important to that. And uh, we're going to hear some views about whether, uh, and if so, how the, uh, the, the, the bill can be strengthened uh, and improved because it will go through stages um, where amendments are, are, are available. So uh, members of the APPG are here today listening and we will also do a note at the end uh, to circulate to members. So um, uh, thank you very much uh, from me. I'm afraid I can't stay for the whole event because I've now got, uh, uh, I've got to go on in about 45 minutes to chair a session uh, in another conference about transport in London uh, in COVID. So my apologies for not being able to stay to the end and to hear all the speakers and people's contributions. But I'd like to thank everybody who's made the day possible and in particularly our uh, very busy speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruth, and thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning. Um, and I'm Selene Saxby, MP for North Devon, co-chair of the APPG um, with Ruth. And I am delighted that we are talking about what is such a vital piece of legislation and perhaps in many minds long overdue, um, the Environment Bill this morning. So I'm hoping um, to now introduce some speakers to you. Unfortunately, I need the slide to change so that I can introduce who's coming next. Thank you. Um, so first of all, we have uh, Dr. William Bird, MBE, um, from Intelligent Health, and Greg Fell, who will be speaking both for about 10 minutes, and I understand we're doing questions immediately after that. So if I can hand over to um, Dr. Bird uh, for the first presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, and um, thank you very much for inviting um, us all in Intelligent Health, particularly to, um, to sponsor this. We're actually delighted to be involved in this and it, it is important and thank you for those who are who have come in to listen and uh, hopefully by the end of this session we will understand how walking and cycling is a vital part of the environment bill and can be enhanced more both by the environment bill and it will enhance the environment bill itself so i'm going to have to say next slide each time so um so do apologize if that um gets in the way but this um follows on from when I was involved with the Access Forum um, back in 2000, which is exactly 20 years ago to the week. Um, and it was a countryside and rights of way, which allowed people much more access. And what I was trying to fight for at that time was to get health mentioned that it was important that health is a major part of access um, and well-being. But it was never mentioned. We got one mention of exercise, which was an enormous effort to get it into one paragraph. And now 20 years on, um, we've got the Environment Bill, and it's still, I feel, lacking in the fact that it's not mentioning health. Um, there are two references where it's serious human health, which is about toxins, so it's not quite the same as a biodiversity improving health, um, but no mention of mental health, inequalities, exercise, walking, cycling, or physical activity. So this, I think, is a, an opportunity where we can really start to help get that embedded. 
mainly because human beings are a species and we are a species that still need a habitat which involves biodiversity. So next slide, please. Um, we are social animals and we like to have place. We like to know what we're doing. But one in the middle there is place is such an important part of our well-being and nature in particular. Next slide. If we look at our resilience and how it stops us becoming stressful, the resilience is made up of our social networks around us. That's the people bit. The place is about feeling safe and secure in your environment, the connection to nature, and I'll come on to the science behind that, and clean air and water. And then finally, that sense of purpose and worth and, worth and sense of control. So those are the absolute pillars of resilience. And if that goes well, the stressful events we can cope with, satisfaction, happiness, active lifestyle, health, healthy diet all follow. Unfortunately, it's not quite like that. Next slide, please. So the human um, mismatch hypothesis shows that basically our ideal environment is what we were designed for many, many years ago. And we are now living in a completely new environment. Um, next slide. So, and again. So this next slide is where we are now. And this clearly is not how we were designed. So what this mismatch hypothesis says, and if you go to the next slide, is that the ideal environment is the one with the trees, and then it moves, we've moved into that new environment. And then if we look at the mismatch, um, is that blue area, which is where the urban area, where we've got no nature, but the opportunity is in the middle, where we've still got the biodiversity, and we've got an urban environment, and it's matching that those two together is where our brains tell us that we're actually happier. And it really does affect the brain. So we move on. So what's happened now, of course, is that in our place, again, that resilience on the left, it's all gone gray now, is now creating a weak resilience because we've got a hostile environment and no nature. And, and if you look there, stressful events, have we've got no resilience, so they go to chronic stress. Now, chronic stress, therefore, is a result of having no nature around us. Next slide. So that leads to changes of our behavior. So we become inactive. Our diet changes. We have less sleep and we have an addictive personality. All of that due to this chronic stress that affects the immune system and even down to our chromosomes where telomeres, which is about our shortening of life. And then that problem goes to all of the different elements that cause diseases these days, which is diabetes, heart disease, dementia, depression, anxiety, um, weak bones, muscles, all of that is due to this change which happens in that red box. And if you go back up again, you can see where the place of nature is. It's increasing as chronic stress because of weak resilience and changing our behavior. So what's the evidence behind that? Well, let's have a quick look at the evidence there. The next slide. Inactivity and chronic stress are strongly related. So if you have an area where there's no nature and you've got this chronic stress, you are become less active. That's less walking and cycling. The motivation drops. You're designed to conserve energy because that's what we are as a hunter-gatherer. And therefore, we know that that leads to inactivity. So if, even if we're trying to get people active and they're in this mode of chronic stress, it's not going to work. Next one. Also, when we're chronically stressed, we release something called ghrelin, and ghrelin tells us to eat. It tells us to eat lots of carbohydrate and fat, and that increases calories. And not only that, it keeps our fat in us. So under this chronic stress where there's no nature, we lead to this obesity, and there's lots of evidence to show that. Next one. And what's more, that if you have green exercise, as opposed to working in the gym, in indoor gym, then the profile of your chromosomes, and I mentioned about these telomeres, which help us to know how long we're going to live and what diseases we're going to get, then you increase the telomeres, which actually lengthens the telomeres. So green exercise has a better age profiling than indoor. So it shows it's got this additional benefit. Um, and there's more, if we can go on to the next. So children 
um, who have spent more time in green spaces have these long telomeres. So basically, they're now set up to have a much longer lifespan with less disease than children who have short telomeres who already are starting with a disadvantage. Now, we're starting to see here the inequalities that are starting to develop, because if you've got short telomeres when you're a child, you're more likely to have problems later on in life. Even if you try and change your lifestyle, it still doesn't quite catch up. Next one. And then children who are in green space more often have a larger hippocampus. That's a part of the brain that does behavior and learning. So you can see here that when you've got the comparison of children and they've adjusted for all the socioeconomic grouping as well to make sure that's the same, you've got children again on a better started, um, starting than before. Next one. And the green space around someone makes them feel more included. We know that people are more sociable and more inclusive when you've got green space. When you meet on a concrete kind of area where there's no greenery, people put their head down and go past each other because they feel stressed and hostile. When it's green space or a garden, people look up and they talk to each other. So this sense of loneliness tends to evaporate more when you've got green space. Next one. And it, the perception of health has improved. People feel there's less pain, there's less um, problems with their health, they focus less on it. So again, this is a real um, an important part of how green space affects the local community. Next one, please. But probably the most important here is this green space reducing health inequalities. So you can see here on the left is a, little, a bunch of graphs there um, of light blue to dark blue where there's little green. Now that left-hand axis is, is death, I'm afraid, is what we in health kind of is a fairly good endpoint. Um, one, don't need to know exactly what those figures mean, but one to two, one beginning up to 2.2. But what you can see immediately is those people who've got the lowest income have got a higher death rate than those people who've got the highest income. So that on its own shows the disaster of health inequalities where income really does affect the lifespan of people. But as you move in the urban area to where there's a lot of greenery and they did the adjustment to make sure this wasn't just a class thing, this was very much similar people match, matching like for like, with millions of a population done by the University of Edinburgh, you can see that the gap between the rich and the poor shrinks right down. So if there's anything that's going to shrink the um, inequalities, then green space is part of that solution and is a vital part. It's a massive change that's taking place simply by making more greenery around the urban areas where there's deprivation. Next slide, please. And if you want to, a little plug, if you want to learn more about that, that's a book, the Oxford Textbook of Nature and Public Health. Um, I brought it together with Professor van der Bosch, but there are about 93 professors from around the world where this now is really major research that's going on to understand the benefits of nature for health. It's really done to the neuroscience all the way to how you plan. Um, next slide. So one of the things I wanted to do is to explain them what we're doing to try and get people more walking, cycling and using green space without changing so much the environment. So Beat Street is something we've been doing. We've got 1.2 million people um, in the UK who've now taken part. Next slide. And next one, I mean, you just go through. So this is where we, for six to eight weeks, we change the norm to make sure that everyone is more included. Walking and cycling becomes a norm for that six weeks in a town where we go out and put these little beat boxes on ramp posts with the council to make sure that the people know where they can go and it takes them to green spaces, it takes them onto cycle routes, which they wouldn't have gone to before, or walking routes. And people go out as families to try and get as many points as they possibly can touching their car on these beat boxes. So people come together, schools come together, parents come together, community groups come together, everyone goes out. We get up to 13% of the entire population. And the idea is to try and clean air. We know that in Blaby, in Leicestershire, 23% reduction in, air, in um, air pollution. Next one. And we know also that it, although it's designed for families, you get a lot of people improving their, um, their walking. And that's even 12 months afterwards as well. So this is in Dumfries where they increase people of walking and cycling. So by having, this is what the world looked like for six to eight weeks, people think, why don't we carry on doing that? Why do we have to always 
go back to where we were, when we can walk to school now, we can walk everywhere. And by taking people to the green space, it helps that activity as we saw beforehand. Next slide. And this was in Hounslow, where we just did the um, one beat street and between, uh, with the council measuring how many cars were used during the game, um, 2 to 4.30 p.m., which is school pickup. And you can see that each week, the number of cars dropped down. And even the week after Beat the Street finished, it continued to drop. Next slide. And we've got a great opportunity. 234,000 people are all planned, ready to take part in this next six months. And we're really wanting to make sure that we build this whole legacy of walking and cycling um, in those towns um, all around there. Next one. So the Environment Bill, um, I feel has to include health. You know, we've seen the opportunities of inequalities, of deprivation, of how it can get walking and cycling going. And this is an opportunity for generation. I feel that 20 years ago, we missed that opportunity. This is now again. And I think where it says about people's enjoyment of the natural environment in the environment um, bill here, I feel the health impacts of a nice natural environment would be a better fit. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Dr. Bird. And um, I'm hoping there'll be a next slide advising who the next speaker is. I think it's Dr. It's Greg Bell, Director of Public Health from Sheffield. Um, thank you very much. Hi, uh, thank you. And thank you for the uh, opportunity to speak. Um, there are no slides from me, I'm afraid. Being a Director of Public Health in a global pandemic means I don't get time to do slides. So I uh, have done some speaking notes and they'll be uh, wide, widely available if they've not been circulated already. So. Um, in, in 10 minutes, um, I'm going to uh, set out a case from where, from my perspective as to how active travel will support the environment bill. Um, it, the, 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 sub, the subtext is why we don't cycle and walk very much and why that matters to the environment and what can be done about it. Um, uh, I'll get my declaration of interest out of the way first. I'm a very keen cyclist, both both leisure and work. Um, not a very good one, um, but um, a keen one. So um, 10 broad points. Um, first one, air quality is a problem. We know that. Uh, we don't walk and cycle enough. We know that that um, uh, many, far too many of us drive too much for even for very short distances. A third of all journeys are less than 500 meters. Um, I'll let that thought hang for just a moment. Um, that's bad for us. Um, it's bad for the planet. And it's bad for the environment. Um, thus, more people walking and cycling is obviously hugely important to our health, um, but it's also hugely important for climate, the environment and the planet. Uh, and getting more people walking and cycling won't be solved by simple behavioural fixes, by me standing outside Tesco, handing out leaflets, telling people to walk more. Um, uh, it's uh, obviously, we all know it's far more complex than that. Um, we talk a lot about a walking and cycling culture. Um, I'll, I'll reference a few things throughout, but I watched a movie recently called Motherload. Um, it was a hugely inspiring and uplifting story of how one mum and then lots of others changed the way that they and their city thought about um, transport for them and their families. Um, it is very worth an hour and a half um, for those of you that want to get, get into the business of the, the culture that underpins cycling and how mums think about this. A lot of cycling stuff is about middle aged blokes like me, um, uh, but, but it, it's very it's worth a watch. Um, there's a lot in there on culture. There's a lot in there on engineering, actually. Um, uh, it, it, sadly, it will probably be mainly seen by bike dorks like me, um, but I, I'd encourage everyone to give it a watch because one, it's uplifting. It's a good way to spend an hour or so of your time. But secondly, it's really, really, um, a really, really use, uh, useful watch in terms of how people think. Second point, where does health policy sit? and who is responsible for health. So my um, job description is 24 pages long and I don't understand much of it, but the, what, my, what my boss says he wants me to do is create a healthier Sheffield. He doesn't care who, where or how I work, but basically every, everything that happens in my town contributes positively or negatively to health. Therefore, uh, me being in a local authority environment is absolutely the right place. And similarly, nationally, um, health policy, we all then think about the Department of Health and Social Care. The Department of Health and Social Care, care is um, only partially responsible 
for health policy and the activity of every government department and well beyond government um, creates or worsens the condition that, in, that, that enable better health. Um, so there's a, there's a really interesting point about who's going to be responsible for health policy nationally, and obviously that matters from a walking and cycling perspective, and of course then the knock on to the environment, but it also matters for all sorts of other perspectives. So the actions of the Treasury, the Department of Transport, of DEFRA, who, who may not have an interest in health, but are hugely important to health and hugely important in this context to, to walking and cycling, etc. Third point, infrastructure matters. Um, the Glasgow Centre for Population Health did some work on this uh, um, six or seven years ago, um, and again, the, the reference will be in the note. Um, uh, and um, what, what have we learned about 10 years worth of policy and practice around active travel? Um, uh, and it's all about infrastructure. Not much change is delivered by individual behaviour change interventions. The vast majority of change is delivered by infrastructure and committed leadership. You know, getting the right standards for, for infrastructure and committed leadership over over a, a long period is uh, is is is, uh, is the key. So, uh, the the way in which I, my, my understanding of most transport planners think is is congestion is the key problem on our roads, and the answer is build more road capacity to ease congestion. And that's been the standard thinking for decades. Uh, build more roads. Um, uh, that eases the problem, but it doesn't really ease the problem from the perspective of the pedestrian or the cyclist. Um, more more cars equals more fear of cycling, therefore um, uh, uh, less people cycle, less people walk. Um, there's a there's a notion of supply induced demand, and the more you increase supply, um, demand will will match to to increase available supply. So there's a fundamental thing that needs to needs 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 to shift there if we if we want more uh, walking and cycling, which which is good for us, good for the planet, good for the environment, etc. Um, fourth, fourth point, framing matters. How we frame this problem makes a real difference. I, I often hear transport policy, um, um, uh, uh, transport policy people and or transport planners say 5% of trips are health related by which they mean the NHS. 5% of all trips are related to the NHS, which actually is a startling fact in itself. Um, but I disagree. I tell them 100% of trips are health related by road of whether or not we choose to get in our diesel cars or whether or not we choose to get on our bike or go on the bus or whatever. Um, so 100% of, of, of trips matter. Um, um, we know that um, um, we, we see um, bike lanes and pedestrian infrastructure as an investment for health and well-being, but why not roads? Roads are a negative investment, or roads for cars are a negative investment for health and well-being. Third point on framing, people always say, but 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 Sheffield's not Copenhagen or Amsterdam. Um, and dead right, it's not. It's a bit hillier than Copenhagen and Amsterdam. Um, but 30 years ago, both Copenhagen and Amsterdam were car parks. So back to that point about committed leadership. Committed leadership, we can change the way in which our cities cities work. Um, so for, for, for fourth main area, um, follow the money. Um, the reason why we don't um, cycle and walk a great deal um, is because we don't invest in it. Um, the, the whole of the active travel budget for Department of Transport in England is akin to refurbishing 10 miles of the M62. Um, um, thus, it's no surprise that we don't build that many miles of bike lane or that many miles of uh, um, good quality, uh, good quality walking infrastructure. Um, and we've built a lot of 10 mile stretches of, of smart motorway over recent years for uh, acceptable and understandable reasons. No, no doubt about that. But that investment um, has consequences. And if we want more um, active travel, we will have to invest in it. And that, that investment will need to come from somewhere. Um, um, Local authorities absolutely want to invest more in this space, but uh, but we all know local authority funding in, is is in a fairly parlous position, and it's worth reference back to the um, Institute of Fiscal Institute of Fiscal Studies report back of a year or so ago. Uh, so the, the 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 funding the the will to do this is undoubtedly there. Um, the investment is not there, and it has a pretty low pretty low starting point. Um, why is the money as it is? Um, largely the return on investment model that, that's used to, to set up DFT um, is, is, is based on the premise that um, build roads to ease congestion, that's the most efficient thing to do. 
um, and underplays the importance of the externalities in the economic modeling. So the carbon externalities, the health externalities that go from um, building too many roads uh, to ease congestion and not building active travel infrastructure. So we come back time and time again um, to uh, the, the sort of the, the, the things that aren't indirectly considered in transport policy really, really affect how many of us walk and cycle regularly. Um, and there's, there's, there's a lot of evidence in, in, in that broad space, which I won't dwell on now for, for time. Um, plenty of people are writing excellent stuff in this space. Um, so the two things that, that are worth, worth dwelling on is some work that was done by Arab Consulting a couple of years ago around building activity into the design of cities. I think it was called Cities Alive Towards a Walking World. And there were hundreds of really, really tractable ideas in that, um, which clearly it was written for a sort of a city or a town or a place level, um, but there are probably all sorts of, all sorts of ideas that, um, that, that can have a wider, wider national relevance. Um, and very, very tractable, very doable ideas with which are easy be easily stealable and adaptable. Second one that's worth mentioning is the Transport for and Healthy Streets framework, which is just simply brilliant. Um, and the, the starting point of the Healthy Streets framework is walking and, walk, walk, walking and pedestrians are by far the, the biggest potential to get people out of cars and onto other forms of transport. Um, each, each of those two has a whole bunch of indicators backed by a whole range of scientific, in, scientific evidence to give you the essential ingredients for how we will get more people uh, walking and cycling. Seventh point, data talks. How good is our benchmarking? Not that good, actually. Uh, we don't have enough good benchmarking. How well does my place compared to other cities on um, infrastructure, bike lanes per mile of road, trips and, trip, trips and modality of different forms of transport. We do okay on that. Um, spend on cycling, pedestrian infrastructure, we do okay, but our, our benchmarking could be a lot better and the data does talk. Um, eighth point, there's a lot of dodgy ideas out there, um, a, a lot of vested interests. So a few of my favorites, um, this is a war on cars. No, um, it's a war on the harm caused to our children's lungs or our planet that we'll give to our grandchildren. That's where we need to fight the war. It's not necessarily a war on cars, it's a war um, fought on, on, on other grounds. Um, um, tackling the economy question, um, all of this stuff to get people um, out of cars and onto, onto bikes and on, on, onto, into, into, onto, onto the walking is all bad for the economy. Um, no, there's a lot of narrative on that, but rarely any data. In fact, the data says something akin to the contrary. Three examples. Um, the Environment, Environmental Protection Act in the USA, the Clean Air Act and the, uh, and the, and the economy um, was, fought, was fought very hard by those who didn't have an interest in uh, the, uh, pushing through the EPA. Um, but when you factor in the benefit from addressing health related issues in the EPA, clean air, growing um, uh, the, 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 the uh, nature related benefits, the sustainable technology related benefits, uh, that in itself became a positive economic benefit. Rand uh, Corporation did something similar in Pittsburgh. Um, um, the cleaning up the air was seen as anti-business and anti-car, um, but when you actually factor health into the economic equation, it was really, really straightforward and actually to the contrary of, of, of being anti-business and anti-car, it was pro-business. Um, and and the, the, the building bike lanes will kill passing trade for businesses. The data actually says the opposite. Um, uh, more people walking, more people cycling is good for passing business. Um, and by the time we get into factoring in the economics of traffic congestion, which are ginormous, um, and factoring in the impact on um, the externalities of us not walking and cycling enough. It changes the nature of the way the economics work. Beautiful study from Copenhagen a few years ago. Every kilometer of car costs, a uh, car dri driving costs society uh, 0.17 euros, so 17, 17 cents. Uh, but but every, every, every kilometer cycled um, uh, gains the economy uh, 0.16 euros or 16 cents. So, um, so there's a lot of dodgy stuff that needs to be uh, needs to be uh, needs to be challenged head on. Basically, um, it's important. I should say, um, nearly done. Don't forget the stuff that transport professionals twitch most about is, is buses and trams, the most insecure part of our network. If buses go under, we will all get in our cars, and that will make the problem a lot worse. Um, so, we want this stuff. 
walking and cycling are undoubtedly good for us. They're good for our air quality. They're good for the environment, good for the planet. Um, but we tend to look at this policy in quite a constrained way um, uh, and sometimes the wrong way. Um, uh, and a few schemes here and there won't, 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 um, uh, won't address it. So I guess the, the, the plea going forward is really, really get into the interconnectedness of different policy agendas don't think of health in one box, environment in another box, transport in another box. All of these things are interconnected. And if we do walk and cycle more, that will be good for all of us in lots and lots of different ways. But we will need to change the rules by which the system operates and the inflection points and the leverage points. So uh, thank you for listening. I shall stop there and it will circulate that speaking note later. Thank you very much, Greg. Um, very interesting presentation. So we've got a short question and answer session now, which I will endeavour to get the questions in the right order to the right people. Um, so the first question is to Greg um, and is from John Nicholl. Um, what do you think directors of public health should be doing within their own organisations and within local health or hospital trusts to help transport authorities encourage more people to walk and cycle? Um, well, I, I wouldn't spend too much time thinking about hospital trust, to be honest, because um, um, m m there is, m there's merit in that. But 5% um, of all trips are NHS related. The vast majority of patient contact is with the primary care, not with a hospital. So if I had to do anything around NHS trips, it would be with primary care. And what more can be done? What more can be done there? Um, the pandemic has demonstrated to us all that an awful lot can be done on Zoom or Skype or whatever your, uh, whatever your video video conferencing uh, app of choices um, so there's there is some stuff to be done there I mean my, my um, local NHS and local hospital within it in particular has done a huge amount to encourage its staff and its patients to walk cycle or get the bus its pinch point is car parking space it doesn't have any um, and it can't build another multi-story car park so it's done a huge amount uh, there's a whole bunch of schemes um, that our, um, our hospital is implementing, sometimes with the council, sometimes not with the council, to encourage people out of their cars and onto other modes of transport. Um, I can pick up that, pick up the details separately if, if, if you want to get in touch with me. Um, but the, the job of the DPH in this context is, is kind of leadership and advocacy. I'm not personally going to be a transport policy officer or a transport plan. I'm not skilled or competent to be. Um, the job is advocating and leading for better. Um, so I do a lot of work with the um, Active Travel Commissioner in Sheffield City Region, putting, uh, giving her the ammunition she needs to argue for the health case for better active travel infrastructure um, when she's having arguments with the uh, well, arguments, discussions with the with the Department of Transport. So my job in that context is is uh, leadership advocacy and the the, give, the giver of different perspectives and ammunition for those who actually want to do the right thing here, um, but sometimes they're constrained in all sorts of different ways. Thank you, Greg. And the next question is for William. Um, and I, I'm going to make a comment on it, William, um, before you come in to answer it, if you don't mind. So the question is, what is the magic formula for making sceptical politicians at national and local level decide to establish momentum to deliver quality active travel measures? Um, so I'm not a sceptical politician on a lot of this, but I would personally like to highlight for those people on the call that a lot of politicians come under a huge amount of abuse for supporting some of these active travel plans. As somebody who's received death threats for suggesting closing a bridge to enable people to travel into the town centre on a bicycle. So I'd just like to, for my colleagues who might be slightly sceptical, perhaps put that into context as to why politicians who are trying to represent their, their constituents and residents, um, and that not everyone shares the view. So I would say it was also sceptical residents that we need to persuade. But over to you, Dr. Baird. Um, thanks very much. And I think as Greg said, this is a whole system approach. You know, you can't just be the transport is on its own. Um, and therefore it's anti-car, which is what happens when you just confine it to just transport. I think one of the things that people need to look at is what kind of world do we want our children to grow up in? You know, what is the vision of a place where we're living at the moment? And you don't need to go very far to places where they do get it right. And Greg mentioned Copenhagen and, and there are others, um, where you see the urban environment and nature coming together, where the cars have been you know, kept away more and more, more people are walking and cycling, the noise, the air pollution, all of those things improve. You've got more trees and biodiversity around there, which encourages more people because we've seen that more people to become active. That's the world I think about 99% of the population want to live in. 
And I think if we look at that and then we say, okay, how are we going to get to that world where we're going to have our children safe? They're not going to be breathing in that kind of air. Then you start to put the pieces together of which walking and cycling is obviously a major plank. And I think it's looking at that vision and saying this is a direction towards it rather than treating it as car versus bicycle and walking versus cycling and all the other different things that we come to. So it's what is the world we're trying to aim for um, from and for our children. I think that's a better construct to be able to put these arguments forward. Thank you. And William, the next question is for you as well from Hannah Gardner. Um, why is the Department of Transport encouraging recreational activities? Should it not be DEFRA and Natural England with the Department of Transport to get the links between the rights of way and Highway England roads? Yeah, but Greg might be even better on this one as well. Um, but if I just quickly just answer my bit, um, of course, it needs to be all of them. And um, this, I think the DEFRA and Natural England are certainly now very much leading on the people coming into nature and nature being connected to people. And as I said before, if you really kind of look at the kind of philosophy of it, we are species needing our, our biodiverse environment around us to make us function well. So this actually should be all a part, it should be cabinet office dealing with this in saying that this is the vision that we've got to have of having this interconnectedness. And we can't keep pigeonholing it into the transport recreation exercise. And we're gonna hear Charles later on in Sport, Sport England who have now moved into the whole area. And this is how it should be, this interconnectedness, all trying to go for this vision of where we want to be, to be really great for our health and reduce inequalities. So whichever department it is, I don't think it matters, but it must be an all part, it must be all the departments. Greg probably has a, a better kind of concept on that as well. Greg? No, uh, uh, what, what William said basically. Um, so yeah, we, we have government departments, we have local government departments, they, they, they're all siloed, we know that, and there's just some operational efficiency of that, but the, the, prob the problem is a cross-government, cross-society thing, um, uh, and, and it, it can't and shouldn't be one one department or one person's responsibility. It, it, that's the, the route to uh, the, the route to, to embedding silos further. Thank you both. And this question is for Greg from Amelia Hatfield. Do you have any recommendations or ideas for how transport policy slash strategy teams in local authority areas can work more closely with health teams? Um, yeah, go and talk to them. Um, basically, pick up the phone, go talk. Uh, you'll find there's a huge amount of common ground. Um, in my experience, most transport policy, most transport strategy teams want to, um, uh, to kind of um, engineer their way out of a car-dependent culture and all of the the the, the, uh, the neg negative environmental and health context that that brings, um, uh, and need more ammo and health health policy teams or directors of public health teams people like me will provide different perspectives and different ammo so just go just go go talk pick up the phone and talk i don't think there's a magic bullet or a shortcut to that one but um i think you'll find there's a whole bunch of shared ground and shared shared territory there Lovely. Thank you both very much. And I know Dr. Pearl has another meeting to go to. And, and we've got to the end of the questions from this session. So thank you both very much. Um, and so we're going to move on to the next speaker, who is Charles Johnston, who is the Executive Director with Responsibility for Active Travel from Sport England. So I'm hoping Charles is going to, there we go. Marvellous. This technology is fantastic. So I'm going to hand over to you, Charles. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's always difficult following uh, such uh, convinced speakers as Greg and William, but I'll, I'll give it my best. Uh, certainly, the pandemic has really shown us the importance of local green space and the accessibility of that space has been clearly highlighted. And William has, has explained uh, why that is and the motivations behind that. Uh, they've grown in popularity since lockdown. Uh, with the National Trust, for instance, and other major landowning organisations seeing visitor numbers double um, to their outside spaces, which is really encouraging. Uh, but as you can see from the slide, 38% of people are saying they want to continue walking and cycling more as part of their increased outdoor exercise. And that, of course, means encouraging them to use their cars less as well. But only 24% of adults are achieving the recommended levels of activity in their normal lives. So there's a huge amount still for us to do here. So unless we can create the right infrastructure and the right environment, 
uh, barriers to increased walking and cycling will remain and we need to deal with those. We not only need to think of the quality of those spaces, but also how they are accessed, how they're joined together into that complete whole system and infrastructure that we've heard previous speakers talk about. The quality of the journey to them and the barriers people perceive that stop them moving more. Uh, and particularly, safety is a, is a key issue that we hear about. Uh, the research has highlighted that 66% of people um, consider it too dangerous to cycle on the roads nowadays. Uh, and that obviously is a, is a huge um, a disincentive for people to get onto their bikes. But even the simple things like awareness of what is available and how to best access these facilities, they need improvement. Signage, social media, uh, that signposting is really important here. So from Sport England's point of view, active travel is about taking a, a holistic approach. It isn't just one element. We've got to bring all these, these elements together to create a perfect solution here to encourage people to become more active in their daily lives. We want to help provide the ability for everybody, whatever their background, whatever their circumstances, uh, to access quality destinations in the local neighbourhoods and to reach those quality destinations by walking and cycling rather than using the car. And to do that in a safe and welcoming environment for the entire journey and that journey starting at your front door. Uh, so the stats bear out the real demand for this approach. Um, the Department of Transport data has indicated that um, at peak, cycling was four times as busy uh, compared to last year. Our active lives data is showing that leisure cycling and walking has really boomed and a great deal of that uh, improvement. But unfortunately, with traffic back to 90% now of normal levels, uh, the cycling numbers, particularly during the week, are actually below where they were last year. So the, the return of the traffic has really impacted that good work that was done uh, during the pandemic. If the environment is right, then huge gains are possible in these activity levels. Um, so, for instance, if people generally walked as much as they do in London, uh, there would be 1.3 million more people adults achieving the recommended levels of activity. Um, cycling in Cambridge accounts for 10% of local journeys, but that is six times greater than the national average. So how can we create an environment, as they have done in, in Cambridge, that encourages people for those local journeys to have cycling as their default option rather than to, to jump into the car? And these, what are the barriers then that are preventing the positive impact that active tra travel and active leisure can have on the environment? We know that the major improvement that is needed is our traffic-free, well-lit, green corridors for pedestrians uh, and Greg has described some of the thinking behind that and of course uh, William has described the Beat the Street which is a such an excellent um, um, project for boosting that awareness. Uh, the next slide please. So Sport England will be publishing our 10-year strategy in January. And we're going to focus on five big issues to help people move more. And you can see these on the slides. But one of those five big areas is active environments and how we can work with communities and government to create places that encourage you to be more physically active. So as you can see from the slide, the five big issues all interrelate. So active environments will also enhance community cohesion. It will allow us to recover and reinvent our infrastructure and our, and our sporting infrastructure fit for the purpose for the future. And as we know, all of this has health and well-being um, benefits for the population. So this is about improving the daily activity levels by using cars less, by walking and cycling around your local area more. 
And of course, this is as well as the more organized sporting activity in a leisure facility or in a sports club that is also important. But this is about changing the habits of everyday lives that we're talking about. Uh, the next slide, please. So this is a complicated slide about living locally, but uh, hopefully I can explain uh, and uh, run you through some of it. So at the heart of our thinking is the concept of 20 minute neighborhoods, that most of what you need is available within walking and cycling distance of your home. We're working with many partners with this, including a lot that have been mentioned this morning, the Department for Transport, DCMS, Town and Country Planning Association and experts such as Arabs that were that were mentioned earlier as well. Um, you can see from this slide there are many areas that again interrelate in that 20 minute neighborhood thinking. Uh, this thinking is being developed right across the world so as you can see this slide is taken from um, from Victoria Gardens um, but there are many other uh, cities across the across the world adopting similar approaches. Uh, Paris is another example for, for um, uh, their 15 minute city plan. So obviously people walk a little bit quicker in Paris than they do in Melbourne with their 20 minute plan. And uh, there are a lot of um, academic researchers, the Arab workers, as Greg mentioned as well, that really um, reinforce this thinking and this opportunity. And as you can see, working around the circle, you've got elements of travel, um, jobs, you've got retail. Sorry, Charles, we appear to have lost your audio for a moment. Um, if you could disable your webcam and just go on to audio only, we should be able to hear you. strong return on, on social return on investment. So um, where, where Greg was talking about the finances here, there's a very strong case to say that, uh, that this pays for itself many times over when you look across uh, local and central government funding and budgets. So living locally can contribute positively to our green agenda and to zero carbon local targets targets and we're working across the country with a lot of local authorities that have challenging targets with zero carbon in 2030 and so forth. So there is need to, to enhance the environment and to work on it now. There are clear opportunities across government to bring this thinking together and the, the, the commonality I think of this approach is, um, is quite strong when you talk across those government departments and also um, local governments as well and the devolved authorities. So there's examples where we think this is very applicable. The green recovery, the towns funds, the planning legislation consultation that's going on at the moment, as well as the environmental bill that we're talking about this morning. So I hope you agree it is an opportunity not to be missed and that there's some merit in this and uh, that we can talk further about it. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Charles. Um, and we have one more speaker to come today, who is Roger Gaffin. Uh, apologies, my puppy is joining in. Um, the Policy Director of Cycling UK. So over to Roger, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Elaine. And uh, thank you to the All Party Group for inviting me at a uh, very short notice. Eh? I must say, um, what uh, if I can go to the first slide, Bill? Um, uh, the um, what I'm what I'll be doing today is, if anything, slightly reversing the the the, the title of today's event. We're going to be talking more about what the Environment Bill is doing for cycling and walking, and indeed for outdoor access. Um, so, if I can go, next one, please. Um, there are three amendments that we are seeking in conjunction with three very distinct coalitions and I will be talking about two of them. Um, the, the first one is uh, the air quality targets where we are aligned with the Healthy Air Campaign and Greener UK. I won't be talking about the, the air quality targets this morning because uh, you know, there's been a lot of briefing around, around those issues aligning with uh, WTO targets or 
at air quality limits. And the, the point about the Environment Bill is that Clause 1 of the bill requires the Secretary of State to set at least one target in, in uh, what are uh, four defined key priority areas. At the moment, um, they are air quality, so air quality is in there. The debate is around what the, what the air quality target should be. And then there, are, there will be targets for water quality, for biodiversity, and for resource efficiency and, and, and waste reduction. Um, that's all great, but we think, and uh, our partners in the Walking and Cycling Alliance and the Outdoor Access Coalition, um, think there are opportunities for, for, for targets in other areas too. One of which is road traffic reduction, um, and one of which is uh, access to and enjoyment of the natural environment. Um, so I'm going to be focusing on those issues this morning. If I can go on to the next one, please. So starting with the road traffic reduction target, and this very much picks up on um, the uh, points made by previous speakers about if we want to walk and cycle more, we need, we need to be kind of creating this kind of context in which we drive less. Um, the need to reduce traffic you know, has been, uh, been covered a great deal by previous speakers and indeed by the previous uh, um, all party group meeting. So I'm going to do this very, very briefly. There's plenty more information around this, but obviously the the key point is, uh, is greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the charts there come from the Committee on Climate Change's progress report to Parliament earlier this year. Um, what you can see there is um, a line and a red line that descend very steeply. Those are the, 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 the rates in which we've decarbonised power and electricity since 1990. And then there is a, a blue line which starts off in the middle, but by the time you get to the right hand end of the graph, um, Transport is the top of the pile in terms of the highest emitting uh, sector in carbon in carbon terms, and so the Committee on Climate Change is now saying that this is really important area, and it's uh, um, I will I will come on to what the Committee on Climate Change have to say earlier this week. But clearly there are other other issues here too. There's congestion, road injuries, um, ill health, air pollution, um, quality of life, uh, and, and when we get onto the access amendments, and there are all sorts of things to do with the rural economy and so on. Um, just pick up on the points that previous speakers have made about how um, maximising benefits of, of cycling and indeed walking and other out forms of outdoor out recreation have multiple benefits across many different gov government departments. And that is a huge strength of cycling and other forms of physical activity, which is also one paradoxically one of our weaknesses, because maximising these benefits requires joined up government, which is easier said than done. Um, in fact, I, can, uh, I hope that makes the case for why road traffic reduction delivers benefits across so many areas of policy. Next slide, please. So, um, the context for road traffic reduction. Um, the government is due to publish a, uh, a transport decarbonisation plan. It was expected to come out with a spending review a, a couple of weeks ago. It's now likely to be in sometime between March and May. But um, the uh, transport issue kind of preliminary document leading the way for the transport decarbonisation plan uh, back in March. And the Transport Secretary Grant Chapters Forward talked about how actually his vision for a, low, an, um, a net zero carbon future, a future in which public transport and active travel will be the natural uh, first choice for our daily activities. We will use our cars less. This is a really exciting statement from the Secretary of uh, State. Secretary of State Transport, and it's been backed up by the Committee on Climate Change's Fixed Carbon Budget Report, which came out uh, literally two days ago. Um, they, they postulate several different scenarios for how we might get to um, net zero by 2050, or possibly earlier in their most optimistic scenarios. But their balanced scenario um, talks about our mileage reduction um, uh, by uh, more than 2%, about 2.3% by 2025, and then uh, increase, increasing through to 20, 2050. Um, that too, that was drawing on the fact that the Climate Assembly, commissioned by the um, several um, uh, common select committees, to investigate what public opinion would support by way of action to decarbonise by 2050, they too were saying they would support um, re uh, re uh, reductions in, in uh, road traffic of between 2 and 5% per day. So there is public support for traffic reduction. The question is how much and, uh, um, uh, yeah, and how quickly. The next slide. The problem we've got is that the um, Department of Transport's um, road, traf uh, uh, road traffic models all predict uh, that road traffic levels are going to rise. So you can see that little scatter of rising lines. Those are the one of the lines from the road traffic uh, model, the various scenarios. But uh, road traffic is, according to the Department of Transport, set to increase by anything between 17 and 51% 
by 2050. This is completely opposed to what the Committee on Climate Change is saying needs to happen, which is that bottom blue line. Uh, sloping down quite modestly, and one could argue that uh, we may be able to achieve uh, greater reductions than that, but just halting growth is going to be a challenge to start with, given that the Committee on Climate Change has said we need to make the first reduction is a, a more than 2% reduction in road traffic by 2025, and that's not very far away. Um, so this has huge implications for how transport budgets get spent. And uh, I really urge that we should be kind of modelling which are the 2% of tax that could most easily get people knowledge to get that could be most easily switched to cycling, to walking, to public transport, and what does the spending plan need to look like in order to get there? And that's something I hope we can do bef between now and the, and the next funding review later, um, in next year. In the meantime, though, next slide, there is, um, sorry, can I, sorry, go back one. Sorry, I missed a point in the last one. Um, there is an opportunity in the um, Environment Bill to press for road traffic reduction targets, actually to challenge the target government to say, well, you've, uh, the Secretary of State has said we will use our cars less. By how much less? When are we going to? When is road traffic growth going to stop? And how quickly are we going to reduce it? And that in turn could help kind of front pave the way for that transport decarbonisation plan that's due out in sort of March, um, in sometime in the spring next year. Okay, sorry, next slide. I can go on to the, the other area of target setting that we're keen to pursue along with partners in the Outdoor Access Alliance. Um, well, um, William Bird has already uh, given a fantastic outline of the health, health benefits of, of access, outdoor access, the mental and health and uh, well-being benefits to our health and mental well-being. Uh, there's also the points that connecting people with nature means that they're more likely to value nature, to more likely to support action to improve the quality of the natural environment. Of course, there are rural economic benefits. Um, you know, Four billion visits to the natural environment in 2019, and that has been increasing. And people are increasingly keen to access um, nature near where they live. And that has doubtless been, um, you know, pushed even further forward during the pandemic. And of course, there's also a safety benefit, enabling people to have walking and cycling and indeed horse, horse ride routes away from busy, busy, uh, busy rural, uh, high-speed rural roads. Next slide, please. So. Um, so the context here is that the Agriculture Act, which has now recently been passed, that effectively sets the framework for where um, post-Brexit agricultural subsidies, how they could be spent. And the former, uh, sorry, former Environment Secretary, Michael Gove, when he was Environment Secretary, he was talking about this principle of public goods for public subsidies, that the replacement of the common agricultural policy would not be a straight handout for landowners. It would, it would be that the, the subsidies would still be there, but uh, landowners would be expected to provide public goods in in in, 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 in return for public subsidies. And the um, agriculture act has on in clause one one of the public benefits would be outdoor um, access. Um, and the, there's recently been a Jeffrey Commission's report on, on on the improvement of our national environments on national parks and areas of outstanding that called for a review of access rights. Yet, as Bill was saying, and William was saying in the start of his presentation, the Environment Bill does not talk about access. And the, the, the draft um, framework document the, for the government proposed environmental uh, land management or ELM scheme, which is how they would distribute the, the post practice replacement of the common agriculture policy, does not talk about access. This is at risk of being a serious missed opportunity to provide greater access for walking, cycling, for horse riding, for canoeing, uh, to give people those opportunities to get out into nature, whether it is for recreation, or whether it is simply the school, the, the school, uh, the school kid from a local village to get to the school in their nearest town um, via a safe route. And both could be um, could be supported by uh, by this by this uh, this mechanism um, that is basically there in the Agriculture Act, but not there. Not prioritise in the environment bill as things stand, and I really hope that uh, you know we can um, uh, seek um, support from members of the All Party Group and others across the house um, to see if we can kind of fix that because this could be a huge opportunity. Just to add, the Department of Transport have said that they would entirely support what we're calling for here, and um, we just need to open up that dialogue with DEFRA and hopefully get this amendment added to the environment bill because that is that can uh, really ensure that the environment bill helps. Cycling and walking, as I said, that is the reverse of the Facebook. I hope that's a useful content. I, that, I think that was my science, but that's my finish, isn't it? I haven't got another one, have I?
that's us. That's that's the partners who are calling for these things and a bit of detail of what we're calling for. So access and environment as a key priority in the in the in the um, in clause one of the bill, which is the crucial clause. And then there is additional amendment to make sure that is a priority in future environmental plans. We can't write it into the existing 25 year plan because that was published in 2018. But future environment plans should include access as, 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 a, as a priority area. So those are the amendments we're seeking. And we have a full parliamentary briefing outlining what, what it is, what it, exactly what we're calling for. That has been covered. Thank you very much. And thank you, Roger, um, for that um, presentation. So we're now moving on to the question and answer session. And slightly bizarrely, I have a question, first of all, from Karen Poli. Um, which was, why do you think people are so invested in their cars to the extent that they'd make threats and how can this be changed? Um, and I think an answer to that, Karen, I don't actually think they are that wedded to their cars. I think it's about um, getting people to think about change in a different way and people are reluctant to change and how you bring um, your community with you on a journey and recognising somewhere rural like this. It's a far bigger change than it is in central London where we don't actually have any public transport either to ask people to get out of their cars. Um, but I do also at a wider point think it's to do with how people feel it's acceptable to treat politicians of all parties on social media and that actually if we want change and um, people have to take difficult decisions and that if everyone could manage to be a bit kinder behind their computer screens we might all be able to get a bit more done um, so that would be my take on that one and the next question from Lord Russell of Liverpool for Roger is what are the examples of best practice across the UK why are they best practice and are the devolved administrations doing anything better than England um, very good question. Thank you. Um, the well, firstly, the um, models of best practice. Um, I wouldn't say there's any anywhere that is getting everything right. There are plenty of places that are getting some things right, but the full package is, is you know, is taking time to emerge. Greater Manchester has been doing some fantastic planning um, for its, its travel networks uh, under the leadership of um, uh, Andy Burnham, supported by Chris Boardman as his cycling walking champion. They are really kind of getting the bit between the teeth and involving local communities in doing that. But we're also seeing some excellent practice in uh, in, in Leicester. Uh, Sheffield City region is is rapidly playing catch up but with what Greater Manchester is doing. London's been doing some great things in recent years. Um, more rural counties. Um, Devon has done some really good things in the past. Um, you know, there, there, there are, and, and TIC is showing some really recently started to show some really interesting ambitions. So it's not purely a city thing, but we, we are massively playing with our continental uh, partners. Um, Devolved Nations, um, Wales led the way in setting the legislative framework for travel, the Active Travel Act and some really good design guidance on uh, how to design for walking and cycling. England, we've now got that. Scotland is behind in that respect. Scotland is ahead in terms of the level of spending. On it. And of course, Scotland is ahead in terms of its access legislation. Um, you know, it had, it, had the, um, it had the access legislation going right back to uh, 2003. Uh, Wales is considering um, recasting um, Effectively breaking down the distinctions between footpaths and bridleways and byways would be a massive step forward. And I very much hope that England will, will consider consider more. But the, the, the environment bill is an opportunity to provide the quid pro quo for the landowners effectively to sweeten that deal. So this is an opportunity to move things forward in, in parallel with what is happening in Wales. Thank you, Roger. Um, the next question is from Matt Weston, MP for William. Um, is there a sense that the tragic case of Ella Kitty Deborah, who lived near the South Circular Road in London and died from a fatal asthma attack, will be the first of many legal cases? And how will this impact on local authorities thinking and their demands of central government? Thanks very much. And it, um, we know, that obviously, that um, air quality does have an impact on children and adults. Um, in the past, it's always thought to be that um, after we moved away from the smogs of the 1950s and, and the Clean Air Act then allowed the air to become considerably cleaner and particularly with the sulphur dioxide disappearing, um, we thought actually that it was more a long-term problem. So although the death rates have been advertised quite widely as being in vast numbers, you know, up to hundreds of thousands of people dying prematurely from heart disease and from um, lung disease, that was thought to be much more long-term and it was sort of built up. But we're now seeing this evidence that there may be a, some children particularly may be more sensitive to the air quality 
and therefore it becomes a much shorter term problem. And I think the difficulty on the, the legal side and with the science catching up is, is it the air quality itself that's created that change or is it the fact that the asthma is, is around and some people are more sensitive to it? So I think we will see, it would be interesting, you know, for, follow this tragic case, which, which it was tragic. And I think we know that deprivation and air quality go hand in hand, which is absolute disgrace and has to be changed. And I think that's why this environment bill could actually help that in reducing inequalities. So we've got to focus on those areas where the deprivation is there, where there'll be other factors coming together. But I think we will see that air quality had a considerable influence on that child, that child's death and therefore it's going to start to open up some extraordinary kind of um, thoughts about how do we actually tackle this we can no longer put up with it and things have to be addressed rapidly it may not be the total cause but when you add all together those different factors it will become a, a significant cause and i think that may be hopefully something that can be used for good for later on in in, in dealing with this more seriously um, as opposed to that kind of in 20, 30, 40 years time, we're gonna reap the, the harms of it. It's now today. Thank you, William. And um, next question is for Charles, but um, I think if anyone else would like to contribute, that would be great. This one's from Lord Lucas. Um, if you have a low speed limit of 20 miles per hour or below, do you need cycle lanes? Um, so I take the one to start with. Um, Did Charles want to come in first? Or Charles, okay. did you have... Thank you, uh, Roger, Roger will know the, the technicalities behind it, but certainly all the research that we're getting is saying, yes, we need the separation. It's the it's where the two come together that is causing the real, the real grief. So having separation, having the green corridors, having that, that clear, safe, traffic-free environment, we think is really important. Um, so really uh, separation, and where they where the two do come together proper managed junctions with um, with the right uh, crossings or preferably even um, bridges we think is the, is the right answer and that's all the um, the feedback that we're getting from our research hopefully that doesn't disagree with what roger's going to say thanks no, that's, roger. That's fine. i'll just yeah i mean all I'd, I'd, I'd add to that is that what the evidence shows and it sort of backs up common sense is that um, people are deterred from cycling in conditions with either high uh, high traffic volumes and or speeds. And the greater the uh, traffic volumes and or speeds, the greater uh, degree of separation needed. So on a, a lightly traffic street with, with 20 MPH, uh, you will let your children cycle there and that won't be a problem. Um, on even a busy shopping street, 20 MPH won't be enough to, uh, for, uh, to, to create um, a traffic cycling conditions that everyone will feel comfortable with, but relatively light segregation will probably do. By the time you're talking about the cycle track alongside a, a, an interurban trunk road with, with lorries coming past you, you probably cycle, possibly cycling in the opposite direction to them at night in howling winds with dust being thrown up by the lorries. You'd really rather there was a hedge between you and those lorries. So the greater the volume of and, and, and speed of the traffic, the greater the separation needed. 20 mph eliminates a lot of the need for separation, but not always. Thank you very much, Roger. And so the next one is for the whole panel from Matt Weston MP, who is keen to understand what the implications are of the public's rapid, rapid uptake of e-scooters. And um, I don't know who'd like to go first. I'm going to rush on the e-scooters. Um, I'm very enthusiastic about e-scooters. I'm delighted to say we have a trial starting here in North Devon um, with our further education college. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes down on social media. Um, uh, anyone else like to contribute on e-scooters? Roger. Um, yeah, Charles. Uh, certainly, uh, our our office when we can when we can go back to it is uh, in Bloomsbury Street, and it scares the life out of me when I see people on e-scooters uh, zooming through the traffic. So I think um, again some some segregation, but then when they're on the walking and cycling routes, um, some discipline I think is needed because they do tend to be uh, less well disciplined than the cyclists amongst us. So yes, I think it's a, it's a great alternative to the car, but I do think. Um, uh, particularly the speed controls and so forth is needed and certainly at night they need to do a lot more about the lighting and um, awareness because um, uh, they're otherwise you it does scare other users but 
But anything that's that's an alternative to the car that's getting people exercising outdoors has got to be a good thing. Yeah, I mean, Anyone I'll else quickly, want to come in? William. I'll just quickly add to that as well. Um, it gets you know, it gets cars off the road, and that's obviously one of the key things, which is for the public health and in every direction is going to be good. Um, I've also seen families on e-scooters, and you see that combination where they'll be able to talk to each other and you're aware of all the surroundings as well. So from that whole biodiversity and us being connected to nature, it brings people much closer. Um, I agree, yes, there may, needs to be a little bit of perhaps some you know, common sense about how fast they're going and, and the direction they're going and how they're going to be interacting with pedestrians and cyclists. But I think if we can get those people off the car and then into that more natural environment, absolutely excellent. I would like to see, obviously, from a physical activity point of view, it may not be so good, but I think the other health benefits way, way outweigh um, the, the problems of cars and all the um, mental health and the physical activity problems we get with that and the pollution, of course. I think I'd like that up. I mean, we do, we um, we we see uh, e-scooters as potential allies, but it really does depend on how they're regulated. Um, you know, the um, as 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 William said, uh, if if they're too fast, too powerful, and have too high a acceleration, then they become a threat to the benefits of active travel. They become safety risk for, for both for their users and for and and in for pedestrians, particularly the most vulnerable pedestrians. So the balance is about striking a level of you know the speed, power, acceleration that is sufficiently attractive to get people out of their cars without being so attractive to undermine the, the, the health benefits of active travel or to be a danger to the particular pedestrian. And striking that balance is, is, is what the trials are all about. I think, you know, there is a balance to be struck and I hope that the government gets this one right. I'm not sure they have with the trials, but we've got to wait the date. Lovely. Thank you, Roger. Um, next question, Roger, is also coming to you from John Hughes, who represents Lifecycle UK and runs uh, many active travel initiatives supported by Lifecycling UK. So whilst the support for these projects is great, it's always time limited, e.g. the latest tranche spent by March the 31st. Time limiting support does affect the efficacy of these projects. Longer and more flexible lead times would really help delivery on the ground. Can Cycling UK do anything to make funding more flexible in terms of end dates? Uh, if only, I think is the answer to that one. Absolutely, we are we are pushing the we are pushing the government and the and to be to give them their due, the Department of Transport is pushing the Treasury for some longer term funding settlements. The, the, the government's gear change vision document talked about a long term budget for cycling and walking, just like the roads program, and yet we ended up with only a one year spending review, and therefore we still haven't got that long term funding settlement that the UI and even our, our you know. Um, the, the, the policy, the walking cycling policy leads in the part of the Department of Transport would really, and indeed number 10, would really want to get. Um, I think the point though is that we are to some extent pushing it to an open door with both the Department of Transport and with number 10. Uh, we just got to make sure that the message gets through to the Treasury. Um, and, and, you know, I, I remain optimistic that we will get that funding settlement once we finally get a multi-year spending review, hopefully in about a year, in, in, in less than a year's time. We all need to keep pushing together. Thank you, Roger. And I think, you know, I would, um, in defence of the government at this point in time, say that they have been a little busy with the pandemic, but at least it has actually highlighted the need for um, cycling funding to be forthcoming. Um, and I think um, it, it's not just cycling and walking that would like a longer term settlement, I think would be all I'd say at this point in time. This question is also for Roger. And could you talk about how the Outdoor Access Alliance came about, please? It came about really very recently, to be honest. Um, you know, we've been a number of groups that have been had identified. We had a common interest in the in the in the environment bill, uh, and um, we only sort of formalised this name within the past month. And we, it's not as if we've kind of set ourselves up with a constitution and a joint bank account and all the rest of it. We just decided that we've been, to, to be honest, rather left out of the discussion about what should be in the environment bill, and that we've we really need to kind of you know form a bit of a, vi a visible block to say actually the access groups are joined up because there's been a perception from DEFRA, we've heard this from ministers, that they think we're all at war with one another, when actually we're not. So by just putting our putting all of our logos on, on a joint briefing um, and being able to send that off to DEFRA, really very much aware of saying no, we are actually on the same side and want to embrace that. Um, so I hope that the presentation will just give some, make some additional political momentum.
Thanks, Roger. I'm probably broke up a little bit then, but hopefully everyone got the gist. So the next question is from Scarlett McNally, and um, this is to everybody. Please, can you tell us how e-bikes can be part of the solution for active travel, particularly for older people and people with disabilities? Who'd like to go first? Charles? Um, it was, I'm certainly getting to the age where an e-bike is becoming more and more attractive, and um, um, particularly when you get to the... Uh, to some of the steeper hills, so I think it, I think they've got a real role to play. Um, it does keep people active. Uh, um, where you get the right ones, you don't just sort of put your feet up and cruise along. You do have to still pedal to to initiate the um, the technology and the support there. So I think they're a really welcome addition. Um, I think it will extend the range and the age groups for cycling and and. Um, and I think they're a, they're a great enhancement. I'd like to see them being a little bit more cost effective than they currently are. I think that will come with volume. But I think it's great to see um, to see the development of them. There was a bit of a, a sort of, um, oh, you know, they're not proper bikes and things to begin with. I think that's all been overcome now. And the major manufacturers are all introducing e-bike ranges. And I think that's great. But yes, a little bit more cost effective would be great to see, I think. Thank you. And William, did you have anything to add or Roger? Yeah. Well, I'll just add very quickly that in um, in Norway, we did a, um, a Beat Street in Sandnes and um, they were actually subsidising them hugely, the council, for people. And it worked extremely well. It really did wide, wide, widen a range of people who are cycling. Um, and as we all get older, it does include that because in most towns and cities have got hills and you want to be on that bike but you don't want to go up that hill and it's sometimes too difficult if you're not so fit we're trying to encourage the least fit people to become active from a health point of view that's our that's our goal to get those people and they're not going to be able to get onto a bike and go up a hill straight away so i think this is an incredible um you know initiative for and i think looking at norway and looking at other areas where they have really had heavily subsidizing the e-bikes um, and see what the impact that has had. I think we need to look at that and see if there's anything that local councils can do in a similar way. I completely agree. Uh, firstly, e-bikes, definitely not cheating. They are an incredible way of getting people to, do, to take up cycling and or to cycle for trips that they otherwise would not have made because they're a bit hillier or a bit longer. Um, there's evidence from, you know, um, William and uh, Charles both talked about subsidy schemes. There's plenty of evidence from other countries that these are really cost-effective ways to reduce uh, carbon emissions, and of course they add uh, physical activity and other, uh, all of those other benefits. Um, in, purely in terms of, of CO2 emissions, subsidising um, e-bikes is twice as cost-effective per, uh, per pound spent in terms of CO2 emissions, and then there are wider uh, wider benefit. And yet the government's Office for Low Emissions Vehicles, well, they just renamed themselves Office for Zero Emissions Vehicles, subsidises electric cars, electric vans, electric lorries, electric motorbikes, everything but electric bicycles. Um, now, the, the government's big change vision document did talk about that and the, the intention to bring forward a, a, a scheme for, for subsidising e-bikes. We very much look forward to that coming, coming forward. That is, that could be an absolute game changer for all the reasons that Charles and William have, have, have mentioned. Thank you. And the next question is from Neil Dunnage um, to myself and possibly also Charles and anyone else with rural knowledge. So it's, um, Neil says, I live in a rural area of the Cotswolds where the nearest towns are just over 20 minutes away. While I cycle it, it's clearly too dangerous for my grandparents or children to attempt on their own despite the health benefits. And how do we facilitate safer off-road rural cycle routes? So we're very fortunate here in North Devon that we have the Tarka Trail, but I know that Sustrans are obviously doing a lot of work in this space. Um, and the second that the levelling up fund was announced in the spending review, my inbox did fill up with cycling projects joining North Devon up with Cornwall um, and other parts of Devon. So I think there are a lot of opportunities to develop that. And that really, I think, is going to be coming into local council remits um, to take advantage of the funding that's coming through. I don't know if anyone had anything they wanted to add. Well, just to reiterate that the ELM, the ELM scheme, the Environmental Land Management Scheme, could be an additional funding source if we if we get the amendment uh, written into the Environment Bill. It is, uh, and it, it's one of those it's one of those things where it's not about a competition between um, uh, all, all of the other wonderful things that um, the, the the Environmental Land Management Scheme could do. There are a lot of synergies between them, creating a wildlife corridor, hedgerows, and all the rest of it, but creating cycle routes at the same time. They go hand in hand, so they are fantastic opportunities. 
from the ALM scheme in addition to the funding sources that are already there. And yes, of course, we need more funding, um, but uh, yeah, the, the, ALM, the ALM scheme is one potential source of it. Uh, and yeah, I think I agree with that. The only thing I would add is that we are working with some of the major land um, holders, so Forestry England, um, National Trust and others yeah. to try and join up green corridors so that we can join the more rural areas into the to the urban areas as well. So there is that will take time, but there's some good early initiative and pilots that are that are already out there, which are showing the worth of that. So yes, lot to do, but um, but I think the desire is certainly there um, from interested parties, which is great. So one very, very quick additional comment for me. Actually, it, Charles talked about the link between the urban and the rural networks. That's absolutely crucial. That kind of urban fringe, the interface between the, the walking and cycling network within a town or a city and the ability to get from that town into the rural hinterland or the other way, as I said, the kids in the village getting to the, the, the school in the town. That interface between the road, right way network and the local cycling walking network that is exactly what the ALM scheme could be helping to fund, is that interface between the two, but it's crucial. Just, just to add very quickly also that the rural communities have the lowest levels of walking and often cycling as well in certain areas, and deprivation, of course, is sometimes intense in some of the rural areas, but it gets rather left behind because the groups are very small or the villages are very small and therefore often doesn't pick up from the urban areas. So these are targeted groups of small towns and villages cut off from walking and cycling and also the deprivation. So I totally agree, they must never be forgotten in the, and definitely that whole focus and strategy about the rural areas needs to be done. Thank you. And coming to what's likely to be the final question for Roger from Keith Homer, what can be done to avoid allocating road space for cycling, not being to the disadvantage of bus services and thus bus travel? There was one word that broke up, not being to the disadvantage of what? Bus services and therefore bus travel. Bus services. Yeah. Um, this all comes down to how much space is there. there when there's plenty of space, uh, those conflicts are easy to easy to resolve. Uh, the difficulties are what to do when there is a, there is insufficient space. Um, the the answer is, uh, you know, we. The, the Scottish Government and the Welsh Government have both introduced what they've now called in various, they've got different terminology, but it's basically the idea of a, um, a road user hierarchy. When you're, when you're planning out how are you going to design um, for different modes of transport in, in, in whatever space is available, start thinking about walking, then think about cycling, then think about public transport. And then you know provide for the motor vehicles in whatever space is left. And then if that means that a street needs to be um, made one way or most motor vehicles or whatever, that is what you that is the order in which you do things. And that is actually what they've got to do. I've worked by, you know, um, transport traffic engineers, and they do literally that. They work out how much space the junction needs to be given over to the pedestrian movement first, and then they work out where the cycle facilities go, then they work out the public transport, and then they what space we've got left over for the motor vehicles. It's really quite mind-blowing how that that changes your approach to, to street design. Um, it, it can be done, but sometimes it will need to be saying, well, actually, there isn't enough for maintaining existing motor vehicle capacity. Thank you, Roger. And thank you to all of the panellists for a really excellent session today. And my final job is to hand over to Lord Barclay for the closing statement. We can't hear you, Lord Barclay. Is that any better? Perfect. No. Can you hear me now? Well, I can't we hear can you hear now, you. then. Can you hear me? Yeah. Right. Well, that's fine. Thank you, Salome, for chairing this session so so brilliantly. Um, your enthusiasm is really great. And I think we have to congratulate this new alliance, the Art for Access Alliance, for getting together and um, working towards improvement to the environment bill, although or, or I think there's a lot more to do. Um, I was fascinated by the four presentations and the uh, and the answers we had, uh, and particularly starting with William and his view on people, place, and purpose. It's so important a green exercise, but I suppose the same um, policies and uh, and views went through everyone everywhere was 
the emphasis we have to have on safety and health. Um, beating the streets is one thing which uh, is um, dear to my heart, and frankly, the Kensington and Chelsea Council's removal of the cycle lane after just six weeks because the rich people in their Rolls Royces couldn't get to the shops, which are actually shut, um, just shows what a long way we still have to go. I also believe that the um, Greg's view, I think, it was Greg, um, on um, the, uh, the closer environment that we'll be facing in the future, partly because of lockdown and the fear of um, getting in a long distance commuting. And I think it, whether it's a 20 minute distance, I think it was Charles who said it, 20 minutes or 30 minutes or 15 minutes or whatever it was, um, that's going to be our community of the future in many places, I think. And I think the other issue which is so important is the question of safety over the whole journey from leaving wherever you live to where you're going. Um, the Roger, of course, as always, talked about the modelling of traffic. And I think there's a general feeling that the Department of Transport needs to catch up with a few of the ideas that have come across this morning. I don't know how many people have read the new green book that the Treasury published, I think, last week. Um, it's important that you identify how it can be used to improve the safety and the security and the health aspects that we're all looking for, because the Department of Transport is um, the policies on road and railways is still pretty odd. I mean, they've cut a billion pounds off network rails in investment budget for the present five years, which you'd think the network rail would be environmentally friendly form of transport and actually would encourage people by, because of walking and cycling not to use their cars. But they're still going ahead with the Stonehenge bypass. Um, I'm not sure what they're doing with the Lower Thames crossing yet. But the Department of Transport forecasts are, I think they've got to catch up with what many people on this seminar think is important in terms of demand. Um, the other issue which came up, of course, was uh, the um, issues of scooters and cycling, electric cycle, e-bikes and everything like that. But it does come back to enforcement again. And it's fine having new, new legislation, whether it's for scooters or whatever, but unless we can find either a means of self-regulation or enforcement, um, we're not going to get the kind of safe and acceptable communities that we, I think we all want. So um, sort of to round up, I think this has been a fantastic seminar and congratulations to everybody who's taken part. Um, I hope my colleagues in the House of Lords, um, I don't know how many are there, but I hope they'll be, they've been listening because I think now my message to all these groups is when this bill comes to the House of Lords, there'll be a lot of people who will be very supportive of what we're trying to do. There's a lot of people who are also very supportive of um, what you might call the birds and the bees and the environment. Um, aspects which we've just been debating on the HS2 bill at some length but it really is important that you try and get support in the House of Lords um, to balance those who still want, uh, I call them petrol heads, so who still who want to go fast in their cars and, and, and forget the rest of the community but I hope you have many more seminars like this and I wish Selena uh, Selene and, of course, Ruth, every success in the all-party cycling and walking group, which, of which I've been involved for about 20 years. And I think along with George Young, I'm a patron. And um, But I, I, I do congratulate all these groups and what they're doing. But we have an awful lot more to do. And I'd like to see even more amendments come down than you've presently thought about to deliver some of the benefits that we've heard about this morning. So, Selene, thank you very much for allowing me a few minutes to wind up. Thank you.